that or watch it. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. Good evening. Hopefully, we'll get some rain to cool us off a bit. We'll see what happens. But, um, okay, we're still we're in here. Genesis, and we're all the way up to chapter 16, where we will pick up today. One, we're still in the area of Abram's, you know, story. What's going on with Abram? Last week, one of the things that we find is that we get one of the major parts. Uh oh, Sandy's calling. Wonder what happened. <laughs> Hello. Mm. You deleted the email. <laughs> it's telling you weird stuff. Okay. Uh, what what kind of weird stuff is it telling you? I have another meeting going on. Oh, that's my schizophrenia problem. <laughs> I must have two of them going on. <laughs> uh, uh, we got last week's. Yeah, do you have, maybe, what's the date? Can you see what the date on that one is? Because it has to be today's date. Yeah, see, if it's the 11th, that's last week. We need the 18th. That's why it's not letting you in. Now, the email that you got, that I was sending to you while I was cutting the grass. Did you get it? Oh, did I send you fiddlesticks? Did I send you one from last week? <laughs> oh, that that would be terrible. Uh, hang on, hang on. Let me let me see what the date on this one is. Okay, I'm gonna forward you this one. Okay, hang on. Let me do Sandy Mac here. And you didn't. You didn't get the uh, the text though. Well, you don't know how to use the text yet, right? Okay, 11 July is two. Yeah, that was last week's. That's why you're not getting on. Okay, I just sent you one from Gmail. Um, and let me forward one from you from my, where it's not letting me forward it from here. Uh, let me go back to out sent folder and see if I can send you one from here. Um, let's see here. I wonder if you let me resend from this computer. Save as. Yes, I did send it to you a couple of times. I see here a few times. Let's see if it'll let me forward. Okay. Yeah, let me forward it from here. Okay, let me send it from here. Okay, I sent it to you from Gmail and from Outlook. It hasn't come through yet. No, it, it, it should it, it, it should come through right away. It shouldn't take a long time. Um, unless <laughs> unless it's running a week behind and that's why you oh something just came in? Okay. 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 God bless my thing. Okay. Anyway. So uh like I said, we one of the things that you find here in Genesis chapter 16 is that God is going to give another part. I mean, there's going to be more happening, but last week we talked about the main part of the covenant. Okay. But remember, God had already addressed some things that he was going to do for him. We talked about that he was going to multiply him like the sand of the seashore and that wherever his foot trod, it would be his land. And last week, it said, as the stars in the sky. And if you remember, part of the covenant was 
taking the animals, cutting them in half, except for the birds. Remember that? And so that was the covenant that God said, okay, see, uh, I'm going to do exactly what I say. Now, the covenant's not over. The aggregate overall covenant is building. It's something that's going to happen. But if you remember, at the very beginning of chapter 15, he told him uh, that he was going to provide him an heir from him. Okay? And what he told him was he said, you know, um, in, let me see. Uh, Reward, but Abraham's got a little ground five view. I can see. Okay, in in chapter 15, verse 2, he says, But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer, in other words, one of his servants of Damascus. And Abraham, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household, but no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. In other words, not my own progeny, but somebody else. And so he says, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Okay, that's in verse four. So when you go to verse four, you can see that God is telling him that he's going to have a child. I don't know. How would you interpret that? Would you interpret that as God's promise between uh, God and Abraham and Sarai or God and Abraham and somebody else? <laughs> At the time, it should have been Sarai. That's who he was married to. Exactly. I mean, that would have been my take. Now, you have to understand, at this point in time, about how old is Sarai? 90. She's old. Yeah, she's she's probably past the prime <laughs> for having a child, okay? And I think she knows that. And so, I mean, but think about it. If you were in her shoes, I can't say that, but yes. women can, okay? But... <laughs> If you were in her shoes, what would you think if, you know, God had said, you're going to have an heir? Yeah, go ahead, Milt. When Ishmael is born here in chapter 16, uh, Abram is 86. Yeah. Okay. And she's 10 still, years younger than he, right? Uh, yeah. But still, that's oh, still <laughs> pretty far along. And think about it. Has Sarai had any children from him up to this point? No. Not even one. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you have to, I mean, if you were in her shoes, again, I asked that question, would you think that you're going to be the one that's going to bring this child into the world? I would have laughed. And there you go. And she does later, okay? I always said I'd shoot myself. <laughs> well, the, see, and think about the culture at that point in time. If you didn't have children, it was considered a curse. So think about it. Sarai was, I mean, think about what her mind was trying to consider here. Because remember, later on, doesn't Hebrews talk about that uh, Sarah, Sarah called Abraham her Lord? In other words, Sarah wanted to please Abraham. And I mean, how better in that culture to please your husband than to have children, offspring? So think about it. She's probably struggling with how can I do this? You know, because obviously I haven't been able to have children. So we're going to get into a place where think about this conundrum that she's having. And also <laughs> then the conundrum that Abram would be having. Because God's already told him that it's not going to be one of these servants that's going to be the offspring that he's going to multiply his family with, right? Right. So that opens up, that opens up the big question. You know, what do you do in that type of a situation? And think about it. Who is it that God has been talking to all along? Abram, right? I mean, he later 
reveals himself to Sarai and Abram. But for right now, Sarah is still trying to please her husband in the best way she knows how. And I'll explain more of what happens when we get to it, because it was a culture thing that was going on at that point in time. And so we have to understand the culture and not try to interpret it based on our culture today. Because if you try to, especially with our morality and our culture today, you would probably say, that's whack, man. She shouldn't have done that, right? But in this, in their case, it was an accepted norm of the culture. We'll talk about that. So any questions on the introduction before we jump into chapter 16? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. We praise you that you're here with us, and we thank you that you give us this time to come together to study your word. I pray, dear Holy Spirit, that you would open up our minds and our hearts to hear and understand your word and to see your wonder and to make us more like Christ as we get to know you better, Lord God, and to trust you in all things. We give you all the honor and the glory and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and bring up scripture here. And let's take a look at what chapter 16 says. So we know that God's already provided Abram with what's going to happen. And so he's, Abram, Abram's already ready to take this on. And, but Abram's, if you look at Abram, Abram's a very passive guy. But when we saw the matter that happened with Lot, he showed considerable promise in terms of what he went to do to go rescue Lot. Remember that chapter? So we know, but for the most part, he pretty much stands back in the wings, letting God do the directing. And so, so we pick up here in chapter 16 and look at what he says. I mean, we've already said he's going to give them all this land. And we looked at a map last time, you know, considering all the land that he's going to give to his offspring, to Abram's offspring. So now that he's got all that and he comes into chapter 16 and think about that, what Sarah is thinking. She's thinking about that there has to be offspring. OK, and that's like I said, that was a cultural norm that there had to be offspring. That was what was considered a blessing of God, was that you had offspring. So look at verse one. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Reminds me of the Hannah and Samuel story, but we'll go on. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Uh, go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So you have to understand that in this culture that there was, this was an accepted norm, that a servant could become a surrogate for the husband and wife. In other words, a concubine. They would become a concubine and the child would still belong to the parents. In other words, in this case, Abram, Abram and Sarai, it would be technically their child. It wouldn't be biologically their child, but technically it would be their child. And if you understand human nature <laughs> and human relations, you can already see that this isn't going to work out nice and cool and everything else. Okay, if you think that the problems we have between human beings today is different than what they had back then, even though a cultural norm was accepted for them to have a surrogate child, it didn't mean that everything was going to work out smoothly. And the other thing is, too, would you say that by doing this, at some level, they weren't trusting God to make this happen. That's a hard one to say, you know, because, I mean, maybe, you know, looking at it from our perspective, maybe we could say, 
well, maybe Abram should have sought God on the matter before he just gave in to his wife that he would go ahead and uh, spend some time with Hagar. I don't know. I wasn't there. But, <laughs> but when I think about that, you know, now remember, there's no law at this point. There's nothing that, you know, gives Abram some type of moral direction in this. Because it fit within the culture of things. So in essence. Yeah. yeah. And just like he lied to Herod. You know I mean. There was no moral standard. So to speak in that. It was just one of those things he was doing. To look out for his own skin. But. <laughs> when you look at that though. The question is. And we talked a little about, about that. When he lied to Herod. Did he do the right thing? Or did he do the wrong thing? God still blessed him. Even though from our perspective, he did the wrong thing because he lied. Well, half lied. But either way, when you look at situations like that, you know, you say, well, maybe Abram should have sought the Lord on this matter before he took the surrogate. I think God would have answered him on the question if he had asked him. So anyway, but we know that he listened to Sarai. And he probably felt bad for her that she hadn't had a child. And she felt and he felt maybe this would be the way to try to smooth that over. Well, let's see how smooth it got, okay? Mm. So Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Verse three. So Ab after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Now notice, when you say as a wife, think about this more as a concubine than as a wife. Um, if you remember with Solomon, he had a thousand women, right? Mm -hmm. Like 300 wives and 700 concubines. But the concubine also fits in the realm of like a... a, a like a marriage vow between the individual. So, I mean, a concubine would have to get divorced also um, from the man, okay? But in this case, you think about it, that was in Solomon's time. This is before Solomon's time, before there's a law or anything. But so in essence, it seems like the culture allows this to happen it wasn't something where abram's like hey woman what are you trying to do you trying to get put me into a fornication or adultery situation nothing none of that comes up you know it's because it wasn't part of the law so to speak or the legality of doing it in that culture so she gives him the wife basically now, this woman becomes the surrogate, becomes the one who's going to give the child. And I have no doubt that Sarai is trying to be as helpful as possible to meet God's promise. I don't think she's doing it in any kind of malicious way. She's just trying to say, well, I can't have children. So, I mean, how else are we going to meet God's promise? Go ahead, Mill. Did she even know about the promise? The promise was given to Abraham. Well, uh, based on the way I see the relationship between her, he and her, I, he seems to be very open with her. So I, I, I'm i assuming. Laugh? What's that? Did she laugh when the angel well, told her? That's, that's later. That's when she laughs. Later. Yeah. that That's later after this debacle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, we'll get to that. But we'll see that. Later, I mean, when you have hindsight, all of a sudden you can realize, well, maybe I didn't do the right thing, right? <laughs> but for right now, if we're not looking forward to that time, we're just looking at what's happening here. In a sense, I think you can kind of understand. And I, well, even if, even if Abram had not told Sarai, Maybe it was just coincidence that she brought this up. One of the things we know that God does, sometimes God tests us. 
And it, it's very possible that God may have been using Sarai to test Abram, to see if Abram's faith was strong enough, because didn't it say that Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness? So is it possible that maybe God was using Sarai to test Abram, that Abram would say, no, we'll just wait on the Lord because I know he's got the plan. It's a possibility, but we don't know. All we know is that what's going to happen here is not part of God's plan. And we'll see that a little later. But Abram does it. Okay, so we see that, I mean, Sarai gives Hagar, uh, the Egyptian, her servant, and Abram, her husband, as a wife, and he went into Hagar, and she conceived. So Abram's not the problem in terms of conception. Apparently, it's Sarai that, like she said, that God's kept me from being able to have a child, okay? And uh, in a sense, I think that that was God's plan, because, I mean, he had a bigger plan that he wanted to do something greater, you know, through Sarai. But, okay, so Hagar conceives. We see that this happened. We don't know that God has blessed it, but we do know that God said he's going to multiply through Abram's offspring. And like Milton was saying, most likely that was between husband and wife because, hey, how else, right? So, and when she saw that she had conceived, Look what happens now. Did she say thank you to Sarai? <laughs> she says she looked with contempt on her mistress. Okay. And neither of them now, and this is Sarai, looked with contempt on Hagar. Because now <laughs> Hagar was able to conceive. Sarai had not been able to conceive. So, I mean, think about it. It, she's jealous because she hasn't been able to have a child, which is the blessing that she should have from through Abram. Instead, Hagar has conceived. So, and so even though she's the one that suggested it to Abram, maybe Abram should have held out and said, "Let's wait on God's direction in this." But. Anyway, he did it, and so here we are, right? We're in a situation where a lot of times, maybe we need to do that sometimes. Maybe we don't need to knee-jerk react on certain things, but we need to wait on the Lord. Isn't that what the scriptures talk about more than anything, probably, is waiting on the Lord? That's right. Amen. And So I think that that was something that God was trying to show Abram. Now, a lot of times... It's hard to do, too. What's that? It's hard to do sometimes. Oh, agree, agree. So we see that right off the bat, things don't look like they're going to be this, this wonderful panacea, you know, in other words, this wonderful life between Sarai and Hagar now, okay? Sarai is already jealous. She's looking down on Hagar because she did conceive. Now, conceive doesn't mean she's had the child yet. It just means that she knows she's pregnant. Okay, it's at the point where she knows she's pregnant. And it says, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her on her mistress. Uh, so, and Sarai said to Abram. Oh, wait a minute. On her mistress. That's Hagar looking with contempt on Sarai. Right. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. I said it backwards. But yeah, that's Hagar now looking Instead, like I said, she should have said thank you <laughs> to Sarai, but instead she's going to try to demean and try to take the position, you know, of number one wife, so to speak, or whatever, right, with Abram. I mean, that's not going to happen because Abram's not that type of dude. But anyway, we see what happens. So when Sarai gets this kind of cold shoulder from Hagar, look what Look what she does. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. Hey, how often does a husband always get it right with their wife? <laughs> Never. Hey, exactly. The wife is always right, right? <laughs> well, I, sorry, Mary. I didn't mean to do that. Don't beat him up too bad. 
But <laughs> no, no, that's not true in our case. No, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just being facetious. I blame her for it. Yeah, her. what the heck? No, he's never had a wife. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. I've never had a wife. So, hey, you can beat me up, okay? <laughs> but the issue is this. All of a sudden, she's looking at the situation and the circumstances. And doesn't every action we have have a consequence? And in this case, this is the consequence that's come from them jumping the gun. Whatever the reason that they came to this agreement and did what they did, the consequence is obviously not a, a grateful you know, uh, relationship building thing that happened between Hagar, Sarai, and Abraham. So when you look at that, it also makes the statement, man, sometimes we just need to wait on the Lord and wait till he tells us what to do. Because when we do it in our own way, thinking we're helping him, maybe things aren't going to go as well when we try to do it the way we think it needs to be done. Well, I wonder if Hagar wanted to do it. <laughs> well, I, hey, as back in that culture, I don't think she didn't. It's not like she had somebody to go after, per se, being the servant of Sarai. So I think she saw this as a win win, being that Abram was the main guy. Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead, uh, Milton. And it's not always that we're wanting to help God in these matters. Is we're wanting to help ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's what Hagar, I think that's what Hagar was looking at. And Sarai. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I she thought child. she had, she had the right, you know, way to go for her benefit. Yeah. Because obviously that was the case, because look how she treated Sarai after that. Almost like I'm going to take your slot. And, and I'm going to be the one that he wants because I am blessing him because I'm having children. You're not. Yeah. And Abram could have said, well, God said it would come through me. He didn't say how. <laughs> yeah, but but I we think... We always rationalize those things. Hey, isn't that what human beings do? We tend yeah. to rationalize them the way it best fits us, don't we? Yeah. And I think that that's exactly what's happening here. I think that that's the situation. So as we see, so now she's saying, I've been cursed and I'm putting the curse on you, Abram, because of this. OK, <laughs> doesn't it remind you of Adam and Eve, that woman you gave me? Yeah. Oh, but it was that serpent. The blame game's coming on. Well, so we see that the situation is happening this way. Now, hey, I with God. God's going to work it out for good, okay? Because that's how God does things. He works things out for good. And even though, at, you know, that uh, Romans 8.28 hasn't been written yet, God is God. And when he has chosen somebody, guess what? He's going to carry out his plan through them. You know, even if they mess up, God doesn't mess up. So when you look at that, you know, she throws it back on him. And so she says to him, I gave my servant to your embrace. Notice she doesn't call him a wife or a concubine or anything. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. So look what, look what she's saying. May the Lord judge between you and me. In other words, she's saying, okay. God's got to decide who's in the right and who's in the wrong here. Okay, because, hey, obviously, this didn't work out the way I thought it was going to work out. <laughs> I'm getting dogged by this woman, and you are you seem to be oblivious to it, so it's your fault, okay? Yeah. And, and that's where she throws the blame. Yeah. So uh, when she does that, yeah, go ahead, Milton. I also think she could have been saying something like, you're the patriarch. Am I the matriarch or not? Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, hey, this woman's trying to take my place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. So, but look what Abram says. I mean, he solidifies 
that her position is clear, right? Because look what yeah. he says. But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant, notice there, he's not making any attempt to say, I really want her more than you or anything like that. He's putting her right in the position that she holds. It's still Sarai's servant. Okay, she's still Sarai's servant. She says, it's your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Now, I think that that wasn't the wisest way to put it. Because <laughs> basically, there's no boundaries in that statement, right? Yeah. And, hey, what's the old saying about a woman scorned? Yeah. I mean, think, she's going to go after Hagar big time. Okay, because he basically she's been given free will to do as she will. So, so Abram gives her that. Uh, so then Sarai, look what, and of course, you know what's going to happen. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and look what happens. Obviously, so bad that Hagar beats feet. She's out of there. She's like, hey, I'm not putting up with this, I'm out of here. So, and Sarai obviously was in the power to be able to, you know, dog her. So Hagar's like, I, well, if Abram's not going to back me up, I'm out of here. And so she goes. She's out of here. Now, does that fix the problem? No. Nope. There's still a problem, right? <laughs> so... But this is what I love about God. Even when we mess up, and even when we mess up things for other people, a lot of times we find that God is still there for us and them. Remember how God protected Lot because of Abram? Yeah. That's exactly what he's doing here to Hagar. Because Hagar is now attached to them at a very strong level here. I mean... Basically, as Sarah, I put it as he, she's his wife, so to speak. So for all intents and purposes, look what happens in verse seven. The angel of the Lord, remember Pastor Rob's uh, teaching on the pre-incarnate Christ showing up? Yeah. This, this is probably one of those events. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. So she had gone a ways, the spring on the way to shore. So obviously, Hagar couldn't hide from God. So God shows up in a mighty way to her. And look what he asks. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, notice the relationship that he addresses. Doesn't say wife of Abram. Right. Servant of Sarai. Where have you come from and where are you going? In other words, it's almost like the question that God asked Abram and, and uh, Abram asked Adam and Eve in the garden. Yeah. Where are you? You know, why are you hiding? And why were you hiding? You know, it's the same kind of thing. There's got to be depth to the answer that the person gives. So she said. I am fleeing my mistress, Sarai. Okay, fair enough. The angel of the Lord said to her, notice, <laughs> I mean, she is talking to God, okay? And in essence, look what happens. He said, she, the God just tells her, go back. Okay, in other words, I'm not looking for excuses or anything. Just go back and submit to her, right? So the angel of the Lord, return to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will, now this is beautiful. I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Now, do you think this is from the covenant? The sand with, you know, sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. Do you think this is the offspring that he's talking about no no so but but because she is with abram notice that god is not leaving her out of the picture 
Yes, they made a mistake. Well, Abram made a mistake. But notice that God is not leaving her out of the picture. He's not dogging her because of Abram. But instead, God is going to bless her. Okay? And I'll tell you what, she couldn't have received a more abundant blessing than to say she's going to be mother of a lot of offspring. That, in that culture, was like, wow, this is amazing. Only, only God could do that. So look what happens. So God, the pre-incarnate Christ tells her, I will multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And look what he says. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. Now, hey, she didn't have to go in for a DNA test or a sonogram or anything else to find out. God is telling her that she's going to have a son. And when else did you hear of somebody that was going to be named by and the angel of the Lord told them, well, in that, in that case, it was Gabriel. But in this case here, it's probably the pre-incarnate Christ that also said you will name him a certain name. Well, he told Abram to name Isaac and also John, 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 John. the Baptist and Mary. Jesus. There you go. So this isn't something that is, this is the first event, though, that we know that a son is going to be named. Right? Yeah. By God. Yeah. Okay. So his name shall be called Ishmael. And Ishmael means God hears. So think about it. If you had heard this, if you were this woman, and all of a sudden the name is God hears, how would you take that person that's telling you that? Probably they are they represent God or are God telling her that, right? Because <laughs> he knows. So anyway, she's he's gonna she's gonna name him Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. So isn't that amazing that God would still show mercy and grace and love to somebody that really wasn't the wife of Abram in the pure sense of the word, but it was something that Abram did that God is still there for this woman. Yeah, go ahead, Mill. That would be a great comfort to uh, Hagar. You know, God heard my affliction. Amen. So in the future, if I have problems, I could just call off to God. If he hears, he hears. And, and we'll see exactly how she interprets that, okay? Because yeah. this is an amazing, you know, uh, epiphany, if you will, or whatever, God revealing himself to her. Yeah. So now God continues, you know, God the Son, pre-incarnate Christ, he shall be a wild donkey of a man. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's a blessing, but okay, he's, <laughs> he's going to be an ass. I don't know <laughs> wild ass. But anyway, he's going to be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. Whoa. Now, I don't know if that last part of the blessing is something I'd want to hear. But what he what she's being told is that the people that are coming going to be coming from her are going to be against the ones that God has the blessing designed from Abram to be carried out by the covenant. He's saying that that group of people are going to be antagonistic toward the people that come from Hagar's line. Yeah. And we see that today, right? It's the Arabs. Yeah. Yeah. We see that the Arabs hate the Jews. And as a matter of fact, if you look at it, they say they, they'd be glad if they could just wipe the Jews off the map. So we see that that is exactly what has happened. Exactly what the uh, pre-incarnate Christ told her is visible today. So, and it's been that way all along. It's not like it just started up. I mean, it's been that way all along. There has been that antagonism between the Arabs and the Jews. Yeah. 
That's like the beginning of what if thoughts. There you go. So isn't that amazing? It's like, man, sometimes when we jump the gun, there can be serious consequences that may come over time. And look at the consequences that are there today because of one event. Maybe thinking they were helping out God, I don't know. But the bottom line is there are consequences to it and we're still dealing with them today. So, so notice now that Hagar is clear in her mind that she's had a relationship interaction with God. So she called the name of the Lord, notice capital L-O-R-D, who spoke to her, you are God of seeing. And I'm trying to remember what they called him. That was Jehovah. I'm trying to remember what the Jehovah name was that that God of seeing dealt with. I don't want God. I want God of seeing. Because. Uh, oh, maybe that might be in the King James Version. Hang on. New yeah. King James Version. <laughs> Uh, the God who sees, no, they just call it the God who sees. But there, uh, there is one. You know how we have names for God, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah. I know that one of these is that name. There is a name of the God who sees. But in other words, she knows that she's had this, uh, this God uh, event in her life. Mine uh, says it's the well. It's called Beer Lahai or whatever. Oh, that, that's at the which, very end. Which means well of living one. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, because that's named also, because I was looking up here, uh, the angel said to Hagar's servant, da, 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 uh, more than you can count, as you said, you are now pregnant which means God hears. Here, this one's in the New Living Translation. I don't know. Um, I guess this one just doesn't bring that out. I'll have to look that up. But we know that she obviously realizes, wow, you know, I've come into a place where God who sees, God who hears, he has seen me and he's come to my rest. And he's given me a revelation and he's told me what to do. I'm to go back and submit to my master, my mistress, Sarai, right? And so, so she experiences this, the God of seeing, for she said, truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. The God who cares, right? Uh, sees me. Would I have looked here for the one who sees me? I'm just, uh, okay. So. Uh, and then this is what uh, Janice was talking about. Therefore, the well where she was at, where she got water for it, was called Beer Laharoi, which is also the well of the living one who sees me, which is what Janice was saying. And it lies between Kadesh and Beret. So this was the wilderness area where she had gone to get away from Sarai, where the God, you know, reveals himself to her as an angel of the Lord. And think about it. I mean, a lot of times some people say, well, why can you call the pre-incarnate Christ an angel of the Lord? What does angel mean? Messenger. That's what it means. Think of it that way. Is that sometimes the pre-incarnate Christ did carried out a messenger role as he was carrying out the will of the Father. And so it's not wrong to see angel of the Lord. And usually when you see that in the Old Testament, it usually refers to the pre-incarnate Christ, um, that they would use the term angel because in those circumstances, usually you see that he has a message that he's bringing. And isn't that exactly what he did for Hagar here? He had a message. And I'll tell you, it was a long-term message. It was a prophetic message. And Hagar realized that. And she's like, wow, look at look at what I've been exposed to, the one who hears, the one who sees. In other words, God. 
she understood that she was in an amazing situation. And, and we see in verse 15 that the conception worked out and Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore. Look what he called him. Now, why would Abram have called this baby Ishmael? Maybe she told him what happened. I think she told him, but I also think that God revealed it to him, too. I think it was a two-way thing. Yeah. Because remember, yeah, go ahead, Milt. She may have had to go back and apologize to Sarah and tell her what happened over by the well. Hey, I'm back here like God told me, and uh, I'm submissive. Yeah. I mean, she, because she, think about it. The whole story. Yeah, yeah. And as how, a servant. How can, you, how can you keep that to yourself? It's, you amen. Know, it's as today. How can you keep Jesus to yourself? Amen. See, see in the pre-incarnate Christ? Yeah. How could you keep that to yourself? <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. And plus, in that, when you went and you resubmitted to be a servant, a servant did not hold anything from their mistress or master. Right. Okay, they had an obligation. I mean, a, a master could kill a servant slant slave, you know, if they held stuff from them. Yeah. But in this case, I agree with you both. I think I think she just got back and man, I think she's like, wow, I've got to tell him. Plus, it, you know, it was the one who sees the one who hears that told me that this baby is going to be named Ishmael. And this is the blessing that he gave to that child. Abram would have understood that, I think, because God's already, remember I was saying back in the Herod time, Abram hadn't experienced God much yet. So I think that that's why he did some of the things he did. But yeah. think about it now. Look how many times God has already revealed himself in great ways to Abram since then. I think Abram's faith has grown more already to the point where if when he heard Hagar tell him what God had revealed to her, he held fast to it. So I agree with you guys. Yes, I think it came from what she heard and how she related that it was from God. So, and this is uh, who's the one that said Abram was 86? Me, Milton. Okay, yeah. So Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Okay. So we know that when Abram was 100, Sarai was 90. So that means in this case, we're looking at Sarai when she gave uh, Hagar to Abram, she was 75. Because it would have been about a year, right? And we're looking at 10 year difference, so 86 by the time Ishmael's born. Most women know they're past the prime at 75. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's exactly what I'm thinking, too. And I mean, especially if she hasn't had a child anyway. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, now if she had had several children, even then I am still think she still would have said, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we see that I think chapter 16 is all a chapter just about waiting on the Lord, then jumping the gun. Um, because that's what it's all about. But yet we see that God still had a plan in spite of the consequences of the decision they made. And God works it out. I mean, I'm not saying, it, you know, it's probably the ideal in terms of the, the problem between the Jews and the Arabs. But that was God's plan, and it's still in force today, and it will be in force because it was part of God's blessing that he gave to Hagar. Yeah. And I mean, when you look at that, you realize, well, I mean, when God chooses somebody, man, he loves them, and he protects them, and he works things out in a way that a lot of times may not necessarily be the way we want but it is the way he wants. And I think that that all worked out the way God had it ordained and planned to be worked out. Not that Ishmael was going to be the son of promise, because that's not the one from the covenant. 
he's not the one from the covenant, but he still plays an integral part of what is going on. Look what's happening today. You know, who is the one on the Temple Mount today? Islam. Yeah, the, the Arabs, they're the ones that have that. Yeah. The Muslim, Arabs, Islamist but, nation. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at that, you realize there's still antagonism there. But yet we know, looking into the prophetic from Ezekiel, Zechariah, Daniel, and Revelation, that the Jews will have that back. It will be theirs, you know, in the time of the Antichrist. So we know that that's going to happen. And we see that, uh, isn't that also where we find that Abram, Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac? Yeah. On that same mount. So God has a plan. I mean, when you look at it, you realize, wow, God had a plan then, and he still is working out that plan. And this covenant is central to what's going to happen to the Jewish people from mm -hmm. From that time all the way into the end of the age. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, when I look at things like that, I realize, God, wow, you are in control. I just can't understand how people can just write these things off when you can see these things actually happening and yet just say, well, that doesn't mean anything. So I'm not going to trust or believe any of that stuff that you say is to come. He goes, well, I, I just don't believe any of it. It's like, man, there's so much there that already establishes that God is, is in control and that his plan is being fulfilled, whether you go all the way back to Adam and Eve or you look all the way forward to the new heaven and the new earth. It's being carried out. And Abram was a pivotal individual that God used to establish a central part of that whole plan, even all the way into the end of the age, to Jesus' second return, and even into the millennium. Yeah. Amazing, huh? Yes. Sure. So, so that's what we have for our lesson this evening, and we'll get into more of the stuff that we were talking about Um as we start seeing how God's plan does start growing, we'll see of the visitors, you know, that come to visit Abram, Abram and Sarai. And remember we mentioned Sarai laugh. I mean, when you look at things like that, and I'm just going to throw something out. Ooh. But, you know, when when God, when the basically the pre-incarnate Christ comes to Abram and tells him, that his wife's going to have a child. And she laughs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think her mind went back to this event about Hagar? Probably. <laughs> it's like, wow, had I just waited. <laughs> because she laughs, and it's one of those things where you say, uh-oh, why mm -hmm. is she laughing? Yeah. You know, even even the pre-incarnate Christ asked that. Why did Sarah laugh? And what does Sarah say? I didn't laugh. I didn't old. laugh. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> uh, when we get to that, we'll talk more about it because I think we see how God, in a sense, also has a sense of humor. Yeah, go ahead, Milton. And, and I'm wondering, uh, Sarah's laugh, you know, I'm not thinking it was a funny laugh. I think it oh. was a doubtful laugh, like, huh. Yeah. Me? Oh, yeah. You know? Are you sure? <laughs> that's that's what raised God's eyebrows. Right, huh. right. Me? You know? Yeah, where's your faith, Sarah? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's a fear laugh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's one of those things where you look back and you realize, man, that laugh could have had so many different interpretations. But yeah, I agree with you. I mean, if she didn't trust that God could do it here with Hagar and she's 75, why, when she's 90, is God going to do it? Exactly. And, and don't we do the same thing when God calls us to do something we don't expect or we feel inadequate? We're like... Uh, me, me, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> better than me, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
same kind of thing, same kind of thing. But I'll tell you, that's why I think God tests us. And I really think that this was also a test of Abram. But it also fit into God's plan. It's not like, you know, if Abram does it, it's going to mess up my plans. But what it did is it just it just brought into being God's plan the way he had ordained it to be. But it wasn't something that they sought the Lord on. They just did it. Yeah. But God still worked it out. <clears throat> and and Hagar, I think Hagar got the best blessing of it all, really, when you think about it. Yeah, she stepped right into a blessing there. and She didn't even know it. Exactly. And she didn't know it. Exactly. I thought that that was awesome. I thought that that was awesome. And I really like that. Yeah. Yeah, but. I don't think I would want to know that my child was going to be a wild donkey man or whatever and be, I mean, I, that wouldn't make me happy. No. No, I agree. I do too. But the blessing was her offspring was going to be multiple. I think that that was what would have been the big blessing to her. That's why she accepted as a blessing. Yeah, because, I mean, we're going to see yeah. later on that there's going to be more of a blessing that God shows that they're going to have 12 princes and whatnot. Almost mirrors Jacob's, you know, blessing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for that time and those people, you know, that would have been her blessing. I'm exactly. Have multiple. I think oh. her, her blessing was to, to be in the presence of uh, the of the Lord. Christ. Oh, oh yeah. I think that that I I think she yeah. realized that too. Yeah, yeah, I think that was to me that would have been the blessing and the the fact that the you know she's seeing the pre incarnate Christ, which means the Holy Spirit's living in her. Amen. So I think that would be a, a great the greatest blessing. Oh, I I agree, Mary. I think I think so too. I mean, because my Bible says that. He will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't That's... make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a sense, though, she could interpret that to say they'll be subject to my people. <laughs> and think about what Sarai was doing to her. She was dogging her. She's like, oh, I'll get back at Sarai with my people. Mm. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm stretching it here, but in, in a sense, I, I agree with Milton, though. I think what she was most blessed with was the fact that she was going to have big offspring. Yeah, yeah. My because problem. that was really what was considered a real blessing then was how many children you had. Yeah, exactly. So. Any other final questions, comments, agreements, disagreements, insights? Okay, we ready for prayer time? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Did ahead. you all get any rain? Yes. I can't see out my window. I've got cardboard oh. on it, so I can't tell. Oh, we did? Yes. Was it a good it, rain or just a, a it kind of rain? Here. It was heavy. It oh, good. Yeehaw. Did we yeah. get rain? Yeah. Oh, okay. We got oh, rain. good, yeah. good. Well, it we're all pretty much in the same here. area. I mean, it when you think about Lori and Janice yeah. and Sandy and Jimmy and us, we're over on this side over here, Apopka Way. Well, I'm just across the street from you and it rained hard. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, let's stop the recording here.